Welcome to Truth Telling with Elizabeth D'Alto, the show dedicated to focusing on the truth that is always evolving within us and around us, where we explore the potentiality of truth as a highly esteemed value at a time in history when most people have more on their plates than any one human should. This podcast aims to cut through the noise, the ignorance, and the complexity of 21st century living by exploring the truths of a diverse range of incredible voices. From authors, artists, creatives, and educators, to activists, speakers, and those in various scientific and esoteric fields, our guests hail from cultures and countries all over the world. On Mondays, we post interviews, and on Sundays, we post sermons, which are more personal and revolve around whatever I'm using on that week. No episode of this show is meant for everyone, and every episode is meant for whoever needs it on the right day at the right time, and you never know when that might be for you. Not all guest views will reflect my own, and that's intentional. We don't learn, grow, heal, or improve by staying in our comfortable bubbles with all of our people who look, think, or live exactly how we do. In this show, you'll get the full range. Everything from health, communication, money, success, parenting, desire, and spirituality, to making pivots and transitions in life, and topics related to psychology, storytelling, gender and race issues, emotional intelligence, and sacred activism. We can learn a lot from each other, and we need each other. You can expect courageous conversations when you tune into the show that will range from insightful, uplifting, and illuminating to uncomfortable and sometimes even confrontational. But no matter what, they'll always be filled with compassion and curiosity. Each episode invites you, with a ton of love and respect, to listen with your heart and mind wide open. If you love what you hear or find it useful and inspiring, the best way to show your appreciation is to share the episode and subscribe. Thank you so, so much for listening, and now for today's show. This is episode number 248 of Truth Telling with Elizabeth D'Alto, and today's guest, Nagam Weeby, is a research analyst, an artist, and a human rights advocate. Quite the combination. The truth that's having the biggest impact on her life right now? Being present. In the interview, we talked about the play she wrote and produced, Confessions of an Arab Woman, which was adapted from Jumana Haddad's book, I Killed Scheherazade, Confessions of an Angry Arab Woman. It was the first play she ever wrote, let alone produced, and it was a wild success. So we talked about the trust that went into a project like that, as well as the support, collaboration, and balancing such a huge undertaking with a full-time job. We also geeked out on her culture and how her passion for theater and background in science intersects. We talked about what happened for the people who participated in the play. And I have to tell you, I love, love, loved hearing all of Nagam's stories and experiences. I hope you love it too. Enjoy and share. As far as what we've got going on over here, if you have not yet checked out our Wild Soul Movement Weekend Workshops, we have some spots left in Chicago this summer in August and Asheville, North Carolina in October. Our New Jersey Wild Soul Movement Weekend Workshop in April is officially sold out. So sorry for all of you New Jersey lovers. You'll have to check it out next year. I'm sure I'll be doing more things on the East Coast. And if you have not yet checked out the Trust Assessment, be sure to go to thetrustassessment.com and see if you're one of the people for whom trust is a much larger issue than you might think it is. All right. Let's get into the show. Nagam, I'm so excited you're here. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you for having me. Of course. So the first question is, what is the truth that's having a big impact on your life right now? Right now, it's being present. Just being present at the moment. In what way? In everything, like whether it's a conversation with a stranger on the street or a project I'm working on, just being present and not thinking about the next moment or what to do next or what I did yesterday or just being at that exact moment. (laughs) This is a great point. I wrote something about this. I feel like it was a couple years ago now about why whenever we barely celebrate what we've just done before someone's asking us what's next yeah, or we're thinking that ourselves. Yeah. Well, I've always been like, um, what's next? <laughs> so even when I'm done, like I just finished something, I'm like, okay, now what? Now what? And, um, yeah. yeah. And I'm learning to just be, or like sometimes in conversations as well, like you're just waiting or like, if it's not an important conversation, usually I'm like, oh, um, I need this to finish to get to my next thing. 
<laughs> and and I'm learning or like right now it's like practicing being present and just listening to the person who's talking to me. And I've been having wonderful conversations since I've applied to that truth. Right. Isn't that cool that <laughs> just listening, like actually yeah. listening? Yeah. I, I think when when we have this intention, we realize how often we're not listening. We're yes. doing what you said. We're in our brain thinking about what's next, whether it's the next thing I want to say, the next thing I want to do, what's my next meeting. Yeah. Totally. Or thinking about the person. I feel like our brain is really loud and busy, like so many <laughs> thoughts at the same time. So like, yeah, learning to be present and quieting, like, like calm down for a second. I'm just trying to be present here. Yeah. We'll later. <laughs> just come back, be here now, like Ram Dass, right? Yeah. So I'm, I'm really excited. I love, you call yourself an artist and a human rights advocate. And mm -hmm. I appreciate that. I really identify with the word advocate much more so than I would with the word activist. Mm -hmm. what's, you, what's your definition of advocate and why did you choose that word? Well, I think activist can be an advocate, but advocate, like it's like activist is part of an advocate. Like you can be an, you can be an advocate through activism. You can be through art. You can be through a book you write. You can be through um, standing up for somebody or like helping somebody, giving back. There's many ways you can be an advocate. Well, I feel like activist is like it limits you to like activism or like what activism is. Yeah. And I mean, obviously, either both have so many different expressions, but I, I like that um, definition. So I want to know, I want to hear all about your play. Yeah. <laughs> Can you tell us? Sure. <laughs> so my play uh, was called Confessions of an Arab Woman. And it was adapted from a book by an author in, from Lebanon, and she's called Jumana Haddad. Uh, she was she's one of the most powerful women in the Middle East, based on like business magazines and like Middle Eastern. I don't know how they do those uh, ratings, but she was all she's always listed as one of the most powerful women in the Middle East because she's a women's rights advocate, human rights advocate, and she's always been outspoken and she always uh, risked sometimes her life to say, to make a difference and say things that need to, need to be said over there. So her book was, uh, is called Confessions of an Angry Arab Woman. And it's about her journey and the things she had to go through and she had to face uh, to be where she is today. So I reached out to her and I mean, I read the book and I could relate to it as an American Lebanese woman. Because there's a lot of, um, even if I'm here, there's a lot of culture that is also involved. So I could relate to a lot of things that she uh, talks about in her book. So I just, it was like very like, I'm like, I want more people to know about this. Because also here, usually Middle Eastern is associated with specific traits. Mm -hmm. So you don't see a lot of like, oh, you can be a Middle Eastern woman and you can be powerful and you can be not a victim and actually you can be doing stuff, <laughs> like, you know? So I was like, I wanted more people to hear about that book, to hear about that message. And also I wanted more people from Middle Eastern background to see that this is possible. Like, there is this option. And so I just, I'm going into too much details. Let me know. If no, you no, 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 <laughs> it's not too much detail. I'm loving this because okay. as you talk, I'm jotting down notes of all the other follow-up questions I want to <laughs> ask you. So please keep going. Yeah, so I, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I fell in love with the book. I got her email and I reached out to her. I was like, can I, and I've always been involved in theater. My dad is a director. I've always been involved in theater at school. Like, so I was like, oh, I want to adapt this into like a play. And wow. it was just like, you know, my own project, like, not, I'm not thinking big or I wasn't at the point. So I just reached out to her and she was like, I love the idea. We like, she replied. I thought she's not going to even reply. She's so busy, but right. like, she replied. We reached out to the publishers. We got the rights. I started the adapting process that took like a year, year and a half. Yeah. I'm curious about the timeline on this. So when was it that you reached out to her? So it was, I think, uh, December or Jan December 2015 or January 2016, like around uh, that time. And how long did it take you to get the rights? That sounds like it's, you said, oh, we got the rights. That sounds like it was probably it was like way three, more complicated than. 
six months because after she responded, because she, we had her yes, it was easier. Yeah. Like when we talked to the publisher, because the author was on board. Right. Oh, that's cool. So it was just like log- logistical stuff. Like, are you going to make money out of it? What's what right. are your what's your purpose? But because we had her on board and we had her support, and she actually also emailed. Like she was very involved in the process. So oh, wow. it was like about three to four or five, like around six months, we got everything. Cool. Yeah. And then, I mean, I wrote and rewrote and wrote and rewrote. <laughs> and by the end of it, it was. So what I did is I transformed her book into We Are in Her Brain. Oh, cool. So the play was We Are in Her Brain. There were voices of her that represented memories, that represented um, limiting beliefs that represented stories that were stuck with her and also voices that are different parts of her personality. Yes. And, and they tell her story and they fight together until they own their power at the end of the play. Mm. So it's the process and it's like inside, it's all inside of us. Cause I feel it's, it's, unless you own your power in here, it doesn't matter what you do outside. So like, yeah. And, um, I did it where it's six, six characters represented her voices, her different voices. And I cast each character as different ethnicity. Oh, interesting. Why did you yeah. make that choice? Because it is a Middle Eastern story, but it is, it can be any woman's story. Mm. And I wanted to make that clear. <laughs> how did, like, how did she feel about that creative choice? Did she have an opinion? She loved it. That's awesome. She loved it. Yeah. She was amazing because she wouldn't read. I wanted her to read the draft because I was scared. I'm like, what if she doesn't like, I mean, it's her book. It's her mm-hmm. story. And she was like, I don't know. She didn't even know me, but like she trusted me and she believes in creativity and in mm. like freedom. And she was like, this is your baby. I want to see your vision of my book. I don't want to read it. That like kind of makes me want to cry. There's so many, there's so many layers to that. How old is she? Um, she's in her forties, I think. Wow. I was assuming that she would be like an elder. Like that feels like, you know, someone who would be much older and has like the respect and the power and the confidence to just like support you in that way. Yeah. And like the generosity of like her baby, her book and going, no, just take it. You yeah. take this thing and you make, it just shows such a, um, lack of attachment or ownership. Yes. And it's even like her own stories. Yes. That's amazing. Yeah. And she, she came and watched the play. So she came from Lebanon. Wow. And the day before I'm like, you want to see the dress rehearsal? And she's like, Nope. <laughs> wow. I'm going to watch opening night with everybody. And so it was cool. amazing. Like she was crying during the opening mm. night. She loved it. Thankfully it went in a good way. Her right. giving me the freedom. So, so yeah. And then, um, I think it was a great choice having the different ethnicities because, a lot of people came from different backgrounds and we would always, so the play was an hour and I had, that's amazing. It's so short. And I had a Q and a after, cause I wanted to have the Q and a be part of the play. Mm -hmm. And that discussion that would happen in the Q and a was like as important as the play. People would just stay, everybody would stay and they would just talk about how they relate to the play. Like even women from different backgrounds, like it was amazing. And even men, they're like, I didn't know that. Like, it was it was a great discussion after yeah. every every performance. I was going to ask about that. Did it seem to resonate more with men or women, or was it pretty equal? Pretty equal. I mean, women a little bit more, but but it resonated with men too. I love this. And so, where where was it playing? Is it still playing? How can we see it? Is it recorded <laughs> anywhere? Now, it, everyone listening and me are like, wait, we need to have this experience. <laughs> Yeah, so we we played. It. So as I was telling you, it was a one weekend thing. Like I was just it was one weekend. my personal okay. project. Okay, that's what that was the plan. Right. So we did one weekend. We sold out. Then we extended another weekend. We sold out. Then we were part of the Hollywood Fringe Festival, and that was like full houses. And then we won the producers award, and we got extended by the festival. Mm. And it became a six like eight months. We were like playing it and. It was crazy because for me, when I started, it was like, this book is so amazing. I just want some people to see it. And then it was just, it kept getting extended and extended. Um, We're not playing it right now, but we may be 
doing it again because a lot of people keep asking about it. Um, but yeah, we'll keep you updated if we Thank do. Thank you. And what, so what was that like for you to just have this little seedling of an idea that was more of just like a passion project and then it turned into this big thing? Like, how did it impact your life? Because do you have a job? Do you have a family? Like, what else do you do? How did it interact with everything yeah. else? So, um, I mean, it was it was pretty okay with my job. I have a full-time job. I'm a research analyst. <laughs> so it was, like, mostly at night. Um, so with that, like, it was okay. But I think it impacted everybody who was involved with it, like me and even the actors, because, like, you can't unexperience an experience. Like, going through that, it just opened your eyes on a lot of things and um, teach you about yourself and others. And it's, like, it, within the process, I feel like I grew as a person, as a woman, and as a, of course, director and producer and writer. But, but it's like, I can't, it's like the experience just made me, elevated me and elevated, like mm. taught me a lot about myself and, and everybody. What were some of those, if you had to list like one or two, like key things or some of those biggest things that you learned about yourself? Um, trust, mm. trusting myself. There are many times where I was, because it was my first time directing it. I mean, I've been involved in theater and I had a lot of support too from directors and prof previous professors um, that will come and give me advice and all that. But it was my first baby like mm -hmm. as a director. So there were many times that I would trust my intuition and, and, and go with what I think is right. But inside of me, there were voices were like, you don't know what you're doing. Yeah. <laughs> this is going to suck and all that. But then the result wasn't that. So like, that was my biggest learning, like knowing that I know, just yeah. trust myself. Yeah. That's amazing. And what about the writing part? So you're a research analyst. I know you said you grew up in theater. <laughs> Had you ever written anything like this before? Uh, no. I mean, I've written like poems. I've been, po I have published poems in like uh, anthologies and books, but no, not a play. I haven't. I've written like small skits or monologues for classes, bases or like projects, small projects, but I've never written like a whole play. Um, the writing process was, it was interesting. <laughs> it just kept unfolding because I just went, I think that's what I do in my life in general. I focus on whatever I'm working on and I turn off everything and that's mm -hmm. how I could do so many different stuff. Yeah. But yeah, like with the writing, it was just like focusing chapter at a time. So I would focus on that chapter, adapt it, and then be like, that doesn't make sense. And then rewrite and rewrite. And then once I'm like, it's okay, let me move on and then move on to the next chapter. And that's how it was like, uh, slowly, it was slow mm -hmm. and it was piece by piece. I love talking about creative process with people and it sounds amazing. Definitely that you, you were working off of something. You were working yeah. off an existing work rather than starting with a blank page. Yeah. I find starting with a blank page to be harder, so much more excruciating. Yeah. So that's really amazing. And, and, I, and I like that I'm hearing you say it was kind of iterative. So I'm going to work on this part, work on this part, work mm -hmm. on this part, finish this part and keep going. I know yes. some people try to just like spit out the first draft yeah. no matter how it is. But it sounds like you were like, no, I need to kind of almost yeah. perfect this part and then move on. Yeah. Yeah. I think, yeah, that's my process in general, like yeah. with creativity. I just get overwhelmed with the whole, I with the whole I thing. So I just, I forget about the whole project. I'm just like, I'm just doing this. And then once I'm done, I'm like. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm with you. If, my, if anyone on my team is listening to this, I think they still listen to the show sometimes. My project manager, she's like the big project that like she wants yeah. all the steps and I'm like you. I'm like, I got to finish this part before I can go on to the next thing. Yeah. So she's, it's something like we're constantly negotiating in our working relationship because she <laughs> needs, and I'm like, I can't go there yet. I can't go there yeah. yet, but almost, almost, you know? And it's, yeah. it's interesting because when you are the creator of the thing, everyone else kind of has to not bow, but your creative process is kind of king or queen in the situation. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And I mean, even like, you know, I'm a very big believer of visions and like knowing where you're going. And it's like, I knew I saw the play on stage, but I didn't know how it, how it will look. Yeah, yeah. Like I saw Jumana coming from Lebanon and being happy with it. Mm. And I knew it's going to happen. I knew from the beginning, I wanted 
to cast different ethnicity actors. Like there are some stuff that I knew from for the big picture, but then the writing, I was like, I don't know how it's going to look like. We're going to see. So I appreciate this again. And so for people listening, anyone who does anything creative or aspires to, there's a there is there's this um, bouncing back and forth between like the macro, the big picture stuff, mm-hmm. and then the micro, the the day to day. Okay, I need to finish writing this scene and translating and converting yeah. and adapting this chapter right now. And, and, and navigating that, that can be a real mental and emotional kind of yeah. warfare, huh? Yeah. And, and there are many times in the year and a half or, yeah, when I was adapted where I was like, I don't know what I'm doing. Who do I think I am? I don't want to do this. And I'll just leave it for two weeks or three weeks and then I'll pick it up again. <laughs> be like, we're not going anywhere. She gave like, it was a big deal for me that she said yes. Like, I'm like, I can't, I can't just drop it. Like, what yeah. do you mean? <laughs> That's cool. So there was there was a level of commitment that wouldn't let you quit, but you no. honored your creative process. Yeah. Yeah. And I like that you said you would take space from it because I, I'm with you. I need to do that sometimes too. I'm actually, at the time we're recording this, I'm doing that on something right now as well. And yeah. it it just, it feels good. It's very counterculture though. Yeah. And I feel like there is a culture of like, keep going, keep going, go, 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 go. And I can't, I can't function like that. I get, I get, I'm, I'm just, even though I, I accomplish a lot, I do a lot, but I need to be like, wait, where are we going? What, what's happening? Hold on. Mm-hmm. Let, let me, let me take a breath. I yeah. just, I feel that's the only way I can function. Like I can't. Yeah. And then again, I think everyone is different. So po- some people yeah. listening are probably really resonating. Sounds like our creative process is quite similar, but some people pro- might not be. They might be the like, go, go, go. Or yeah. like all the details need to be set up front before they can even begin yeah. instead of just being like, all right, let me just start this thing and see what unfolds yeah. and see what happens. Everyone's so different in that way. So another thing I was really excited and you've kind of touched on in a little bit to ask you about is, you know, being a really dynamic and multi-passionate person who creates the space in their life to pursue a variety of things. Yeah. I think often also the cultural messaging or programming is, this is your lane, stay in your lane. Mm-hmm. But you're, you're on like a five-lane freeway. <laughs> yeah, I'm on my own freeway. And you're switching um, lanes. Yeah. <laughs> I think I, I haven't been comfortable actually owning it because like for the longest time, I think even when I was a teenager, I was always involved in the theater department and then the science department <laughs> like and I've always been I've I'm curious about different areas and I've always been involved in doing good in different areas but I think as I grew up like it was I wasn't comfortable saying that because I was afraid that you know because you're not good enough if you're spread you're spread too thin or like you're t- all over the place yeah wait so, pause. sorry I'm gonna interrupt you yeah. I want you to pause on that for a second This is also, I think this is really false, not for everyone, but what you just said about being spread too thin, you're not good enough. If you're focusing in too many things, you're not going to be good enough in any one of them. That does not have to be true. No. Yeah. (laughs) I, and yeah, so like for, for the longest time I wasn't comfortable. Like, so when I'm with the analyst people, I just talk about analysts, Mm -hmm. analyzing data and all that. When I'm with the creative people, I talk about creative. I never mentioned the other part of me until the play happened because then my coworkers came and watched the play. And were they like, what the hell? Yeah. (laughs) They're always like, they're like, wait, you're an analyst and what the heck? Like, how did you? (laughs) Yeah. And then my actors and the produ- like the people who were put helping me with the play knew I had a full time job that has nothing to do with with the play. Um, so yeah, that's when I was like, you know what, I'm done trying to like hide. I'm interested in all of that, and I'm yeah. doing all of that, and I'm okay with it, and it's okay in my standards and whatever. <laughs> leave I, me alone. <laughs> I appreciate that a lot. And so, and when you say leave me alone, did anyone actually bug you about it, or were or were you in no, your head feel, thinking that they would? Yeah, in my head or sometimes comments like, oh, you're doing too much or Mm -hmm. slow down or stuff like that. And and I would sometimes think about it. I'm like, am I doing too much? Like, okay, yeah, I get I'm aware when I'm overwhelmed and I'm aware when I need to like prioritize, but I'm okay. Thank you. (laughs) Like, I'm not doing too much. I want to do all this stuff and I'm still okay. Like, I'll I'll let you know when I can't handle it anymore. Yeah, Yeah, because sometimes people will say that and yeah. 
Just their, I mean, that's their own – that I do believe is a projection of just like their own limitations on yeah. like life, what's possible themselves and all those things. Yeah. Well, and sometimes I, I get it. They like, care also about me because mm-hmm. they don't want me to of course. crash or like – and that happens sometimes. Like you do too much and you crash at some point or maybe you're not giving your – hundred percent in one area that is po- like possible. It can happen. But I think, um, right now I'm at a place where like, I'm aware where I'm at and I'm very conscious of like how many projects I'm doing and am I being overwhelmed or mm-hmm. do I need to say no to stuff? Cause I think also at some point I would just say yes to everything. Cause I was so curious and interested in everything yeah. and I'm learning to also like take care of me. So I get also some people come from like caring about you. Like they don't want you to yeah. How have you learned that patience? I think this is fun. We're actually very, very similar. The curiosity thing yeah. gets me. I want to like dive into all these things. This is why I have an Amazon Prime problem. I am <laughs> so like, if you go, my, the way my house is set up, the, the bottom level is the garage and the mail slot is in the, the, the garage door. So, um, you know, Amazon Prime, the packages, and then I'll just, I'll open things and I'll leave them on the washing machine, which is also in the garage. I, I probably have like five books. Oh. sitting on my washing machine. Yeah. And then when you come up into my house, there's like this little foyer area where I have a little table where I put like my keys and my shoes and my bags and stuff. There's like two more books there. And I haven't even cracked them. And like, why am I ordering more books? You know? Story of my life. Because <laughs> every time like I listen to a podcast and somebody's somebody's talking about their book or sometimes like I see something and I get so I do, and I don't want to forget. So yeah. I'm like, I'm just going to order it right Better now. Better just order I it with one click. But then I, yeah, but then I'm like behind. There's like ten books. I'm like, okay, I don't know when am I gonna get to read. Yeah, all like, of I them. need three months off out of every year just to read yeah. all of the books. Yeah. <laughs> What's up, beloved listeners? Quick break in the show to remind you that the trust assessment is alive. It is kicking. It is out in the world. And if you have not taken it yet, what exactly are you waiting for, friend? It's over at thetrustassessment.com. We've been receiving amazing feedback from the people who have been taking it since we put it out. And what's really cool is whether your trust in yourself is low, whether it's you know medium, mid-level, so-so, or whether you have a lot of trust in yourself, in the reports that are associated with the assessment, you also get to learn a lot about how to apply trust in your life, the specific context for trust in the different areas of your life. There's a lot of information there from my many, many years of study, practice, observation, and experimentation with myself, with students, and with clients. So it's super useful. The resources beyond the free report are super inexpensive. There's an advanced report. There's a workshop. I have a bunch of workshops coming up in March and April. So if this is something that you're curious about, you want to know more about, whether you want to see how you could apply it in your own life, or maybe you have your own clients, your own people in your life. Maybe it's your children, and you want to be showing them uh, at an earlier start than you got how to trust themselves. There's some really useful and really valuable information for you within all of the resources that come after you complete that assessment. It takes about five minutes, so you need a little bit of time, and it's totally worth it. So again, head on over to thetrustassessment.com. Thank you so much for checking that out. If you love it and you want to share it with your people, we greatly appreciate that as well. And back to the show. This is so fun. So, all right. I love to connect the dots. So I'm curious if you've ever noticed before, or maybe you haven't noticed, but it is a thing where the analyst part of you informs the creative part of you and vice versa. Yes. I think it's like great that I'm in in both because um, both sides support the other side. Mm -hmm. Like for example, for my play, for being like first time director, and first time play for a play to be that successful, like talking production wise and value and being able to cover expenses and have like, usually in creative processes, you're always like behind or like not, you're not able to cover expenses. And I think my analyst side kicked in and was able to plan a budget and how are you going to get the budget and how are we going to reach out to people and all that, like the details the numbers and stuff like that. I think my analyst side was like the hero behind being able to yeah. be successful in that area. Yeah. And on the other hand, when like I'm like I'm so creative with the analyst part, where like I'm like, but what about this? And why do we do? My manager is always like, you always ask why. 
It's like, I'm always like, but why like that? Why do we do it like that? What about that? Why like that? It's and the I'm curiosity. Like, it's like yeah. the, the inner two-year-old going, but yeah. why? But why? Yeah. But why can't we do it like that? So I'm always like very uh, creative and trying to find like different ways. And sometimes it doesn't work, but right. <laughs> it's, it's there. But there's only one way to find out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I love that. And so how did you do that, by the way, if you don't mind sharing? Like the budgeting, I know nothing. I love when we have people on the show who do things that I know nothing about because I find it so interesting. What was, How did you fund it? How did you get a budget? How did you find actors? Did you pay them? Like were there volunteer things? What did all that structure look like? So uh, first thing, the budget, like it was mostly the venue, um, the like there are like the programs, advertising, marketing, like it was mostly that. And like rehearsal space, maybe sometimes like lunches or dinners for the actors. Other than that, everybody on the team was mostly volunteer. Um, They just believed in the process, in the project. Uh, And it was like upfront, like I told them about it. I was like, I don't, if we make money, and, and the thing is after the first week, and I think we did cover expenses and we had extra money and I distributed on everybody. It was nothing, like it's Mm -hmm. not, worth what they gave to it. But from the beginning, we're like, I don't have a budget. This is like a project I'm (laughs) doing out of nowhere. Um, but this is the message of it. And this is what, like, I want to get out. And if you'd like to be involved, um, if we make, if we cover our expenses, I'm going to distribute everything that we, every profit will be distributed equally on everybody. And I had like some amazing people that just said yes. And they didn't care. Like even people when we did make profit and I was, they're like, I don't want my money. <laughs> like, wow. Just put it back in the play. Cool. So that's really cool. So I was lucky in that way. Like having a big pe- like uh, network of people that were, that believed in the play and wanted it to see light. Even they gave their time. And some people gave their, like some people who weren't actors, but like designed the program, designed mm-hmm. the flyer. It was amazing. Like when I, once I said it out loud, people were actually also reaching out to me. Like, how can I support? What so do I need cool. To? Yeah. And it, that was like, I'm so grateful for everybody who was involved in the play. And was that mostly like, so do you, do you have a community of Middle Eastern or Lebanese specific friends and family? Is there a network? Was that, um, a lot of the people who were very excited to support, was there anything, was it connected directly to the culture and having like spreading the voice and awareness of the culture or was it more kind of like a whole range a of people? Whole, it was a whole range of people. It's awesome. Um, yeah, like some Middle Eastern organization, even like after the show, some Middle Eastern or Lebanese organizations came and watched it mm-hmm. and then they would leave and be like, what's your address? We want to send you a check. Cool. keep doing what you're doing. Ah. So a lot of like, uh, mm. yeah, a lot of people from my community, Lebanese and Middle Eastern, uh, supported, uh, either financially or like helping or even spreading the word and yeah. just talking about it. And then, but, but in general, the people who worked on the play were a range of different, like so ethnicities, cool. different, even different States. Like there are some people in other States, like that I've taken a workshop with and like, we're still connected. Like my, our flyer, um, a designer and she, uh, she was in another state and she's like, I just want to be part of this. So it's so it awesome. Amazing. And and that tells you like, that was a validation for me. I'm like, okay, this is important because I wouldn't have that much support if it was like a whatever subject. No. no. Yeah. That's very cool. And so I'm also interested. I love thinking about ripple effects and impact, a measurable impact. So I'm wondering, any of the actors or any of the people that were really involved, any kind of opportunities open up for them, doors open, creative, whether it was internal or external, right? Like maybe they realized, I want to be doing more meaningful roles or work or, you know, anything like that that you know of? Yes, a lot. (laughs) It was a lot. Like, uh, first, yeah, like everybody's witnessing it. I mean, my actors even witnessing, like we've had a lot of also, it wasn't an easy process. There was a lot of hard times. There was a lot of times that we had to deal with stuff as a group and seeing all that and being part of the process, but seeing the results and seeing that we were able to do it. Like uh, during our closing night party, like a lot of my actors came to me and they're like, thank you, because I didn't think this is possible. Like, Mm -hmm. I didn't think you can just have an idea and just be persistent and keep going and then do it. Like you open, like, I didn't even think that is like a thing. 
So it was amazing. And also I think during rehearsals, because the, the play was very, like, it was a lot of things to think about and reflect on and uh, relate to in your personal life. So I know during the rehearsal process and during Q and A's, a lot of times actors are like, Oh my God, this hit me. Like this is about me and my boyfriend. <laughs> yeah. And like, it was, it was a lot of like aha moments. So that was like amazing too. Cause that gave me so much energy. Like the, the how yeah. many people that affected, whether from the audience or people that were involved in it, it was amazing. Cause when I first started, like my first video that I put out to, uh, see if people want to donate or like, uh, announce the VIP tickets. I said, like, if it affects one person, I'm satisfied. And it did like affect so many people. So I was like, thousands, yes. would you say thousands, hundreds, thousands? Um, maybe like hundreds. Cause it was so, like a small, so, but again, like that ripple effect in my brain. When I think about like everyone who sat there, it had an impact on them and somehow it like went and rippled out. So Probably the trajectory was probably thousands. Yeah. Well, and then now that you're, I don't know, yeah. have you done other it's, podcast interviews and stuff about it? I've done one, but people, uh, well, I've done a lot of interviews, especially in the Middle East. I was like on every TV. So the there Middle you go. It's definitely thousands. Yeah. So I think, yeah, like, no, you're right. It's definitely thousands because in Lebanon too, they still talk about it. Oh, and man, um, so cool. the author was on a lot of interviews about it as well. Mm. And then even here, like on Sunday, I was... I was uh, going to like a Lebanese event and somebody was introducing me to somebody. And then that person was like, oh, yeah, I watched the play or so it's like still people talk about it. Or yesterday I had a, a call with some we're trying to plan an event at USC and he's from there. And he's like, when I knew I have the call with you, I, I mean, I was Googling your name and then you are the same person with that play. I've heard so much about so the play and it's cool. been a year now. And I'm like, wow, OK, <laughs> people still like, I love it. Remember it. I also <laughs> love the fact that because it was just a passion project for you, one of the things that this really proves is how important it is to not be attached to outcome. Yeah, because you just wanted to get it done. Yeah, You are like, we need to sell this many tickets and we need to get this and this person needs to see it and we need a review here. Like you literally, it was just your passion. You just put it out. There was no attachment. And then look at like how magical and like, yeah. all these things that you couldn't even plan for or expected happened. Yeah. And I think like believing, yeah, like just being passionate about it and believing in what you're doing. I feel like if you're doing anything, but you believe in the message you're putting out, like yeah. Up, the doors will open. <laughs> like, that's so, what I believe in. <laughs> so to kind of circle back to the opening conversation about being present, there's a party yeah. that wants to go, what's next? <laughs> <laughs> but instead of, instead of asking you what's next, what, what is inspiring you creatively right now? What are you excited about? Um, right now, I mean, I've been, I've been writing a lot, but I don't know where it's, it's going, but um, I've been writing a lot about, I think it's also women. It's going to be women, women. My next project, I think something related to women, women in the workplace, love stuff. Mm -hmm. I just want it to be more, the next one, I want it to be more, not like about a Middle Eastern person or a whatever person. It's a story and anybody can be in that story. Um, other than that, I mean, I've been supporting a lot of my friends and going and watching plays and reading. I feel like I'm in the, um, you know, like how the bear sleeps and then I don't know why. I, Hibernation? Like how, yeah. I'm right now in that, like I'm taking in a lot and yeah. just also giving back and supporting. Cause I feel last year was a lot of people supporting me and, um, yeah. And I think, and, and sometimes, and every day I get inspired by things I see or I go to, and I've been writing things down. And I feel like that's the, pro that's what, where I'm at right now. Just like going with the flow and seeing yeah. where just we're going to land. and incubating. Yeah. <laughs> it's beautiful. I, I really am, I'm noticing about you and really appreciating this real connection to your own natural rhythm and processes and intuition and trust and even just having the awareness around, man, like so many people supported me last year. I would love to support others. And it doesn't feel like it's from a like an I owe anyone place. No. It just feels like I received so much. I would like to give now. That's really yeah. beautiful. Yeah, I think, yeah, like this is, I, I think giving back is so important because we 
we can forget that (laughs) we can get caught up in our projects and not like from a bad place or anything. Like it just forget it because you get caught up in your projects and you're like, but I need to finish this. I need to finish Mm -hmm. this. And then sometimes, I don't know. I just, it's very important for me to show up to other people in whatever they're doing and support them in whatever way, even if maybe I don't like their projects, but just showing up because they're doing something, you know? Yeah. I, I love that. I agree with you. I I love to support people's efforts as long as it doesn't uh, go against you know my values no, and integrity. Yeah. I don't have to like it, but mm-hmm. I agree because it takes so much courage, so much vulnerability. Not to use the buzzwords, but they're really just the yeah. only accurate words here for people to create things and put themselves out in the world and yeah. ask other people to be part of things and yeah, wild. Yeah, it takes a lot. Yeah, so that's why I'm like, yeah, we get a show up to each other. Yeah. Cuz also even if you the project you don't like or the idea as long as it's not against like my values or like my uh opinions or not opinions just values but um even that will create discussion will create yes, something that yes. will that will trigger something else to be created. So I feel like it's all good. Even when it's not good, it's good. Yeah. yeah. Well, when I, for anyone listening, I met Nagam because I was speaking at a small event for women in LA uh, a couple, like maybe a month ago now. Yeah. And um, you had, you had just been kind of poking around the podcast a little bit. And I remember you yeah. saying that to me, you're like, I love in the intro that you said, like, you will not just have conversations with people who you agree with. Like, yeah. you'll be there for the conversation. I think that's a really important missing aspect of our culture where people just yeah. stick with the people who think like them, look like them, talk like them, live like or them, shut, all the things. Yeah, or shut down. When, I feel like we should, we, I mean, I don't want to say we should or <laughs> whatever, people do whatever they want. But I think for me, I'm always like, I need to also stand up for somebody else saying their opinion, even though it's against my opinion, because that will let us talk about it. But if I shut down or like, I don't want to allow them to say something because I don't agree with it, then where's that going? Exactly. Like they're not going to say it. I'm not going to say it. And then end of story. So (laughs) you're here, you're here in LA, right? Yes. What part of LA are you in? Pasadena. I'm in Pasadena. You're in Pasadena. And did you grow up in Pasadena? No, I grew up in Lebanon. You did grow up in Lebanon. When did you come here? Uh, 10 years ago. So what, can I ask how old you were when you came over here? Uh, yeah, 17. So what was that? That's like kind of a pivotal time anyway. So that would be right before college. Yes. And did you go to college here? I graduated high school and came here. Yeah. Okay. What was it? Culture shock? What was that transition like for you? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, it was, well, first it was very fast how it happened. So I think even when I was here, I was still processing. Because um, it was not uh, safe at the, during that year. There was like some, I was my first semester in college in Lebanon and the college is in a city. I come from a small town. Um, so, and then there was like troubles where there are fights and stuff like that. It's not, it wasn't safe. And then my dad, we had the papers. We got the papers that year too. And my dad was like, you know what? We're leaving. And mm-hmm. it was like a two months thing. Like we just had to say bye to everybody, just wow. pack our stuff and leave. Like I didn't have time to process it. Like, Oh, next year we're leaving. It was just like very fast. Yeah. And, um, yeah, it was different. I think for the most part, just different. I mean, I've never worked over there in my life. Like I was just like, I was involved in activities and hanging out with friends. And then I had to come here and be responsible and just start working. Um, so that was like, a change by itself, even if it's in the same culture, when you do that change. Yeah. That would have been a change you would have been having anywhere. Yeah. So like, that's a change by itself. And then on top of that, like it's different. It's over there. I mean, I, now I I don't come from a city. I come from a small town. Like it's like 400 houses. Everybody knows everybody. Mm -hmm. And to come to LA, it was just like, Whoa. (laughs) Wild. (laughs) So I shut down for a little, like I was just yeah, I shut down like because before I was creative over there too. Like I would write, I would do stuff. And then for a year here, I just didn't do anything. I was just like sad. I mean, going through motion, like, you know, yeah, going yeah. through day to day until I went to an open mic and then it changed again and I was alive again. <laughs> what happened? At, what kind of open mic? Uh, it was a. Uh, uh, like a cultural center open mic and mm-hmm. people read their poems. Some people performed their music. Cool. So yeah, like I was dating a guy and he was like into writing. And then he was like, 
he and he knew I wrote because I would show him what I write but I wasn't like I was still like you know very hesitant and stuff he was like you should come to this and we started going and then after a while I started sharing and I think that like uh, sparked <laughs> sparked the whatever inside of me was dead for a, for a mm-hmm. second like it, it was alive again <laughs> so like you're obviously like meant to be a creative force in the world it's pretty cool that it like even when you try to go no it's like uh life goes yeah you are (laughs) yeah very cool and then how did you pick how did you choose the path of research um I studied radio television and film and uh it just it's so funny how like it's gonna be a funny story because how theater and and my anal- analyst job is related. So I went to, uh, during when, once I was going to school, my professor, cause I've taken theater classes on the side, um, while I'm doing my degree and my professor had a show and I went to that show and the writer of the show was a ma- manager in a research department. And, um, I won the lottery in the show. You had to pay a ticket, but you put your name and during intermission, the writer picked the name and he couldn't pronounce my name. So he felt so bad. And I won like hanging out with the cast and everybody after. And because he felt bad, cause he couldn't pronounce my name. He would come hang, he come, he came and like hung out with me and he was like, what do you do? Blah, blah, blah. And then I said, I'm studying radio, television, and film. He's like, oh, we have an internship open at our research departments. So and nice. and yeah, and so I sent my resume. And I still had to go through HR and all the process. And then I got my internship at, in the research department. And since then, I've been in research. It's just like after the internship, I got a job. And then that's how it happens. Like It, would, it wasn't like I wanted to do research, but it was related to television administration and you know, television, like the business side, the research side. And, yeah. and it just happened. And it happened to be that I met that guy. That's at, so amazing. And so play. <laughs> again, I just feel like maybe I'm projecting this onto you because I love synchronicity and like magic and things. But I'm like, you live such a guided life. Like, <laughs> yeah. so cool. I do though. Like a lot of times I just go, I'm like, okay, well, let's see. And then things happen. I don't know. I believe I believe that too, but maybe it's just coincidence. We don't know. We don't know. And we, who cares? It's amazing. (laughs) I don't need to know. I could just really be excited about it. So this is cool. You living in LA, when I was compelled to move up here, um, seven, eight months ago, one of the big things was I want to be around people who are doing creative things in like capacities that I don't even know exist in, in ways and scope and magnitude that like my, I don't even know. And, mm-hmm. and it's, it's just so like, uh, the Soho house where I go, which is down the street from me every Monday, there's a composer's breakfast. I'm like, duh, there's so many composers for like yeah. every show, every movie, original scores, just putting together the soundtracks and things. Uh, it's just that one little thing, all the different types of photographers and set creators and people make the costumes and like, there's so many expressions and forms of creativity that I, I like. And being in LA, it's just like a hub for so much. Yeah, it is. And I feel so lucky to be here because I think if we move to another, I don't know, I've never been to another state, but like, like in a way where I'm living there, but yeah. I think I'm so lucky that we ended up here because there's a lot of different people and a lot of opportunities. Yeah. And so, um, can you tell us a little bit more about what, it, what, what do you research in television? Oh, so <laughs> it's just uh, um, just shows that we produce, like how they're doing. It's more like ratings. Uh, got it, got it. Yeah, like uh, how are the shows doing? What is the audience uh, profile? Who is watching? Who's not watching? Yeah, <laughs> putting presentations together like that. That must be really different now because not everything is based on the network because there's so many different ways for yeah, people there's... to stream. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, the the research also evolved to like cover digital. Um, so it's, it's the same research that we used to do for television that we're doing for apps and for websites and just uh, monitoring who's watching, who's coming, how many people come and go. So cool. Um, all right. I want to ask, I forgot to do this in my last couple interviews. So I remembered it yesterday in the car when I was actually re-listening <laughs> to one of our interviews that went up recently. I like asking people random questions that have nothing to do with anything we talked about, 
one of them will have to do with things because I like to ask people what they watch on TV, and we've talked about TV a little bit here, but yeah. it's still tangential. What do you, you do? You like any shows? What's your favorite? Um, I like right now. I like This Is Us. It's uh, so good. Do you yeah. cry every time? Are you yes. a crier? Yes, I don't watch it. Like I DVR it, and then I'm like when I'm ready because I feel like it's too emotional. <laughs> it's so Sometimes emotional. I'm like, I don't feel like feeling right now. I don't want to yeah. watch. <laughs> it's too deep. It's too deep. But no. give me, I need something funny or like yeah, Brooklyn Nine Nine. Like, I'll leave you when I'm like feeling it. Yeah, um, yeah I used to watch Scandal and oh. Everything Shonda Rhimes. Everything I watch um, Insecure. I haven't uh, watched Insecure yet. I really need to. Yeah, who, it's really good. Who and has it started HBO as now? a what is it? Oh, sorry, Hulu has HBO now because it's Insecure's on HBO, isn't it? Yeah, that's been yeah. my barrier to entry. I don't have HBO. Yeah, and Insecure started as a passion project. I think I don't know if you know the story. If these, like it was a YouTube web yeah, series, yeah. and then it got picked. So it was like really, it's really I I don't know. I like when small things get big, and I'm like, woo. So <laughs> good well, for well, you. obviously, <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. So that's I mean. Shonda Rhimes, I, what else? I watched Lucifer. I don't know. I liked it. Uh, it. Yeah, I think that's about it. And are you? I was watching The Crown. Oh, I've heard of that, but I didn't watch it. That's fine. I like to, I like to bring this in because I feel like sometimes on the podcast, this was like a really fun interview where we're just like exploring your stories and your experiences. Sometimes the conversations get like really deep, a little heavy, a little esoteric or like very like psychology or you know, talk yeah. about deep things. And so I think it's it's fun to just go, so what are you watching on TV? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to just bring, like, we're all human. We all do these things. What do you watch? To. Um, I, so I love the Jimmy Fallon show. I'm I'm not really into, like, celebrities and stuff. So that's, that's kind of how I stay in the loop and what's going on. Mm-hmm. And, um, and, but again, the creativity, right? People like creating things and skits and sketch. And I've always loved comedy and like yeah. in all of the ways comedy happens and is performed. I love it. So I love the Jimmy Fallon show. But yeah, Scandal, How to Get Away with Murder. I love Shonda Rhimes stuff. I stopped watching Grey's Anatomy many years ago. But the other yeah. Shonda Rhimes shows I love. Um, Game of Thrones, stuff like that. Oh, yeah. Game of Thrones. I love <laughs> detective shows. People who are listening, like, no, because people tend to ask me this. So people are listening are like, we know, you love Blue Bloods. Um, <laughs> there's just, uh, I'm trying to think of anything else I've been watching more recently. I'll watch Blackish sometimes because I'm obsessed with Tracy Ellis Ross. Like, I don't love the show, but I love her. But you just, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, that's what I've been, those are my standards. Oh, and, Right now, as we're recording this, The Voice is back on. I never watched The Voice until Alicia Keys became a host, a coach. Mm -hmm. And now it's Alicia Keys and Kelly Clarkson, and they're freaking hilarious. (laughs) Yeah, I need to watch it. I've I've watched uh, the Middle Eastern voice, The Voice. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Because my parents watch it, so whenever I'm hanging out with them, like, we end up watching it. Uh, But I never watched uh, the... The one here. I should watch it and compare. <laughs> so a good friend of mine, Laren Alta, who's been on the show, recently posted something on Facebook about wanting to watch some show, but I think it was American Idol maybe because mm-hmm. um, she liked this one person but didn't like this other. And I was like, yeah, that's how I feel about The Voice. I love Alicia Keys, not so much into Blake Shelton. And people were commenting like, oh, watch the UK version or watch this version. I was like, wait a minute. Somehow <laughs> I didn't know that we could watch other countries' shows. And someone was just like, uh, YouTube, duh. And I'm like, man, we really live in the future. <laughs> yeah. That's like, I want to watch. What I love about it so much, though, is the families, I cry. When yeah. I watch The Voice, it's, it's almost like this is us because I'm like, yeah. I'm going no, to yeah. be crying, whether it's because the person's performance is amazing and I'm moved or like the people's family and their story yeah. or they're just so excited. It's, I'm yeah. like, people bringing their grandma out on the stage and I'm like sobbing. Yeah. <laughs> Is there the voice kids here? I don't or think no? so. But don't because in, in Lebanon they did the voice kids and that was too much for me. <laughs> I was like, I can't. Like because when they would say no to them, I'm like, no, no poor kid. Fresh little girl's dream. Yeah, so they're so amazing. And then we talked about being obsessed with books earlier. Are you reading anything? Yeah, right now I'm reading. Well, I just uh, finished. I'm very bad with like titles. The last I'm I started the last word on power. And I started uh, The Awakened Woman uh, by Tara Reid. It was, it was like a, I heard her on a podcast on 
the School of Greatness podcast. And I was like, oh, my God, I need to get her book. Uh, and I there was like the seven. I forgot the last book I read. But the, anything Brene Brown. Yeah. I always like reread them every every year. So like now I'm like daring greatly. Um, yeah. And then I just started The Last Word on Power. and the. What uh, is that with, about? The Last Word on Power? The Last Word on Power is about like business and uh, leadership. Interesting. Uh, but from um, from uh, em- emotional intelligence and uh, perspective, you know, like he talks about stuff that I think somebody who's like from a business, they'll be like, what the heck are you talking about? Yeah. It's like, it's very like about uh, your way of being yeah. and how you show up and stuff. Like that. I'm really wanting to study power dynamics a bit more. Is there anything about that in there? Um, I just started, but yeah. There is, and then there's oh. another one. Um, I forgot what it's it's called. I'll this. You can uh, email me. Yeah, I'll email you. But I just read it, and it was like about stories, different stories about businesses and leaders, and what they what they did and how they went about it. Oh, cool. Yeah, I love that. This year, I'm really getting. I'm, I'm moving a little bit more away from like the personal development, spirituality stuff. I, I mean, I've, I've read so much about that over the years, and I'll never totally move away from it. But I'm really yeah. wanting to get back up into like storytelling, power dynamics, uh, justice issues, race, yeah, and um, creativity. Really, really, yeah. really, and, and the intersection of all of those things. Right. So, Nagam, you're so great. Thank you. You're so great. Thank you so much for being here. This was so enjoyable. Thank you for sharing your stories and your experiences. I think our audience is really going to appreciate you and be really inspired. So um, we'll put links in our show notes so people can go check you out, find your website, and we'll wait with bated breath for your future projects. (laughs) Yes. Thank you so much for having me. This was fun. Yeah, so fun. So thank you again. We'll see you later. Yeah, see you later. And when my, when my dad passed away um, from cancer, I started becoming obsessed with the health side of things. And that kind of led me down this path of like becoming a nutritionist, like learning every single nutritional science fact there is to know. And then realizing that I had developed another breed of <laughs> my addiction, which was basically just like becoming obsessed with clean eating and health. And I was vegan and gluten-free and sugar-free and everything free and to the point where I was like okay I'm running out of things that I can eat now um and so it was then that I realized that okay nutrition isn't the answer here um because I still don't love myself I'm still in this war with myself so finding all the nutrition information out didn't help me 